Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Embrace Race is was excited. We are excited to join with Ed Webb for this um, webinar to connect with more of you um, educators about this topic that we love so much. Um, so my name is Melissa Giraud. I'm a co-founder and co-director of Embrace Race. Um, and if you don't know EmbraceRace.org, you will start to know a bit about us. We are an organization that supports uh, caregivers, educators, all kinds of child-facing folks um, to raise kids who are informed, thoughtful, and brave about race. Um, so I'm moderating today, and I am going to introduce the panelists um, in alphabetical order. First, we've got um, Andrew Grant Thomas, uh, Dr. Andrew Grant Thomas, some people call him, but not in his home. Um, he is also a co-founder and co-director of Embrace Race. In fact, he is my co-founder, co-director, and my life partner. So that's another uh, connection. Um, and he, uh, doo -doo -doo, he is a dad to two amazing tween children, a partner to Melissa, an only child, a longtime racial justice guy, and a black man of Jamaican origins in the United States, born on the 4th of July. Uh, he champions efforts he believes can make a meaningful difference for real people and communities now, not 100 years from now, but in his lifetime and in the lifetimes of his two children. Uh, welcome, Andrew. And then we've got um, Debbie Lee Keenan. Uh, so Andrew's he, him, Debbie Lee Keenan, she, her. Uh, Debbie is fantastic. Uh, she is a longtime social justice educator, lecturer, consultant, and author. She's been in the field of early education for over 50 years. Uh, she's a former preschool, special education, and elementary school teacher, director of the Elliott Pearson Children's School at Tufts for quite a long time. Uh, she's been on many various faculty, including Tufts, Leslie, uh, the University of Massachusetts. Um, she has many awards, books, movies, uh, movies now to her name, and one that um, was award-winning and really helpful to teachers, I think, is called Reflecting on Anti-Bias Education in Action, the Early Years. Uh, Debbie is Chinese-American, the child of immigrant working-class parents, and is part of a multiracial family. Thank you, Debbie. Um, and we, we are privileged to embrace race to uh, collaborate with uh, Debbie on multiple things. So excited about that. Um, and then last but not least, Christina Rosinski, another doctor here, um, is, is a white former educator and academic serving as the research to practice program manager and, at Embrace Race, for which we are so lucky. Um, in this role, Christina translates insights from scientific research to inform caregiver and educator practices to support healthy racial learning in young teacher. Uh, Dr. Rosinski has worked with children for most of her life, including as an early childhood educator and in collaboration with the content research team at Sesame Workshop. She holds a PhD in applied developmental psychology and brings an evidence-based lens to her work with Embrace Race um, in translating from research to practice and back again. Outside work, uh, Christina is often watching and reading sci-fi, collaging, we have to talk about that one, and birding with her partner. The way we're going to run this uh, presentation is we will have Andrew and Christina uh, from Embrace Race present some slides uh, about some work that we've been doing on children's um, early racial learning. And then we will have a dialogue, bring Debbie in, and I'll ask some questions of the three of them. And then we'll close with Q&A from you all. So I can turn it over to Andrew. Andrew. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, always, uh, Melissa said of Christina, um, introducing Christina last but not least. Doesn't that make you wonder who is least? Is Debbie least or am I least? But it's but that's not the topic of conversation this time. Um, my three <laughs> colleagues are all preschool, have all been preschool and or elementary school educators, right? And yet it was as parents that Melissa and I, um, you know, that was a main hat we were wearing when we decided to launch Embrace Race. So we had lots of personal experiences, lots of formal learning around race, gender, uh, other uh, dimensions of identity, and lots of professional experience. And then we became parents. Uh, we are parents to two kids, now uh, 14 and 12 years old. 
And when they were much younger and we were thinking about um, something like Embrace Race, first we were looking for information and resources that would help us parent these children, right? Um, and we were unable to find that those resources, unable to find that community, especially as they might be directed to parents as opposed to educators and really to parents of young children. And it turned out that even now, for early ed educators, uh, there really isn't nearly as much as there could be. So that's what we're trying to do. Here's our mission of Embrace Race, to organize and create the resources, programs, and communities that we all need, especially parents, educators, and other adults in the lives of children, right? So what do we mean by resources? Of course, there's some time to dig into it right now, but we're talking about you know, the, some of the things that we have created include things like, you know, the webinars, more than 80 webinars that we've done, the, um, you know, uh, Drawing Differences Arts Program for Children that we're piloting now. We have a lot of uh, evidence-based action guides uh, and a special set, a core set that we're also piloting now. We have lots and lots of resources, and I hope, you know, you'll go to embracerace.org to check out all we have. And we also talk about communities like the Color Brief community, which is for parents and educators, especially for all caregivers, right? Again, all adults in the lives of kids, but especially parents and educators to kids of color from birth through eight years old. Right? So that's about, again, can we, um, can we give you access to the information, to the guidance, and to other people who are um, facing similar challenges to the ones you may be facing as a caregiver to a young child of color. I also want to bring attention to, you know, what's at stake here. So it's creating resources, programs, and communities in order to support us to raise kids who are thoughtful, informed, and brave about race. And we'll come back to this a bit later, but this is not only about nurturing good human beings, right, who embrace others across race and so on. This is about, um, as important as that is, and certainly why Melissa and I started Embrace Race to begin with, the stakes are even bigger, right? They're societal. Race is implicated in so much of how we treat each other, of the institutions we create, and of how we are together, that the future of multiracial democracy in this country is itself is at stake. The stakes are huge. So we're formed in 2016. We go along, we're doing our work, and then COVID happens almost three years ago now in this country, right? COVID hits. And what's unusual about it isn't that, of course, it's a, it's a, a massive uh, event for this country. It hits every community. But what's unusual is that it is um, has very differential racial impacts, right, on communities of color in particular, and that a lot of people come to understand that to be true. In terms of this conversation, that might be the most unusual part, that lots and lots of people sitting at home, paying more attention to news, uh, COVID coverage, of course, is uh, enormous, come to understand that different racialized communities have, or have very different kinds of vulnerability to something like COVID. And then in May of 2020, um, we have the murder of George Floyd, which sparks this tremendous outpouring, this, this search from a lot of people, including parents. We see this at Embrace Race and educators and others for more resources to, with which to engage children around race. And in response to that, you remember there's talk about racial reckoning in this country. In response to that, there's a backlash. And the form of this backlash, or one prominent form of this backlash, are the headlines that you see on the slide in front of you. All right, so what you have is lots of uh, people pushing back against efforts to talk not only about race and racism in our classrooms and our schools, but also um, to talk about you know, anything related to gender identity, sexual orientation, and gender expression, and so on. 
And of course, it's not just about headlines, right? There's a lot of heat going on. So here is what you see is the aftermath of a, a school board meeting in Virginia where critical race theory or really, again, engaging race or racism in any way uh, in the classroom, in schools, in Virginia, was a topic of conversation. And here you see someone being arrested by police just emblematic of all the tremendous heat and anger uh, and passion around this topic. And what's important, um, you know, one of the most important sort of uh, really tangible manifestations of all this energy around teaching of race and racism and honest history to our children is that there's a lot of legislative action across the country. So PEN America is an organization very concerned with freedom of expression and freedom of speech and they have tracked what they call educational gag orders, right? Meaning, again, those policies, those bills, those laws being passed to tamp down on teachers and schools' ability to engage students on these topics, especially race and racism. As of last month, February of uh, 2023, 193 of these bills have been introduced in state legislatures. Uh, in representing 41 states, in 19 states, uh, these bills have become laws, right, with more pending, and 122 million people live in those 19 states. So this is a very sizable impact, right? Luis Derman Sparks, one of the uh, central figures in, uh, you know, early education bias, uh, sorry, bias education, anti-bias education, um, especially in the early childhood years, and a close colleague of Debbie Lee Keenan's said this, children will naturally grow up to be non-racist adults only when they live in a non-racist society. Until then, adults must guide children's anti-racist development. So what, uh, and this of course is absolutely true, right? So we need more adults, not fewer, engaging, right? Parents, educators, a whole bunch of people. And we're dismayed, as many of you are, because these gag orders um, are trying to take away the ability of one crucial group of educators, one crucial group of adults, educators, like most of you are, from being able to do this work. Yeah, so as we grapple with these really heated conversations about what is and isn't appropriate for children to learn about, it's really important to remember that scientists have been studying how and what children learn about race for years. And what we know supports the idea that we have a responsibility to engage with children early and often to help guide their understanding of race and racism. So a lot of people, including many parents, many educators, believe that children are completely innocent about race, that they don't see skin color or notice differences between people. But in actuality, when we look at the research, children are actively taking in information from their environments, even as infants, and they are beginning to notice the physical differences associated with race, even within the first year of life. So by three months, babies will actually look longer at faces that match the race of their caregivers, especially if they're in more racially homogenous environments. By the preschool years, so three to four years old, kids are already developing biases that match our cultural stereotypes, where they have come to associate being white with goodness, wealth, power, status, and to associate people of color with more negative traits. And this actually makes sense if we think about all of the racialized patterns that children are perceiving in the world around them and all the messages about race that they're trying to make sense of. And whether that's uh, who lives in what neighborhoods, who does which jobs, who goes to which schools, um, who are the central characters in the books and shows and movies that they're taking in. Um, so all of the, these messages are being picked up by kids of all racial backgrounds. Uh, by six to eight years old, children are starting to be able to understand and identify experiences of discrimination. By middle childhood, so around eight to 10 years old, children are starting to pick up on and internalize adult norms around race silence. So they will intentionally avoid mentioning race, not because they don't notice it, but because uh, they're learning. They've come to learn that it's considered rude, inappropriate, or racist to name race out loud. 
And also around this time, their cross-race friendships are starting to decline. Um, and of course, that decline leads to fewer opportunities to connect um, across race and learn about others' experiences across racial lines. So all of this shows that from very, very young ages, children are learning about race, whether we are intentionally talking to them about it or not. Um, and when we don't actively guide children in making sense of these patterns, we leave them to draw their own conclusions. And in that case, they're more likely to internalize messages from all of these other sources that suggest that the inequalities that they see are deserved, that there are inherent differences between racial groups that justify that different status that they have in society. So as adults, um, yes, we can talk to children about the world that we would like to live in, right, in which everyone's treated equally and fairly regardless of race, where we are celebrating our common humanity, um, that's great, but we also have a responsibility to talk with them honestly about the world that we live in right now that they're perceiving where people are treated differently based on the color of their skin. And that's not right, that's not okay, that's not fair. Because that is the world that we live in. Um, we know that race has implications for all parts of our lives, including big and small moments. So race has implications for whether cars stop at us for at crosswalks and how far away they stop, uh, the amount of pain medication that we are prescribed, the value of our homes as determined by appraisers who might judge a home differently depending on whether um, they think it's owned by a black or white person, for example, um, how we're treated by law enforcement and the justice system, the chances that we will die or lose our babies during childbirth, the extent to which we are uh, impacted by climate change, and so very much more. So in this world where race does matter, our children's racial sensibilities are influenced by the patterns of bias and the patterns of structural racism in the world around them. So if we don't help them make sense of what they're observing, the ideas about race that kids pick up and internalize from their environments can end up perpetuating the same cycles of bias and different life outcomes depending on race. And that idea of breaking this intergenerational cycle of, cycle of bias is reflected in this quote from a parent in uh, our recent Embrace Race survey. Uh, this parent said, race and racism education is vital to make sure we don't repeat the past. If we don't educate on these subjects, how do we try to do better than our ancestors? And contrary to the narrative that race education is divisive or makes white children feel bad or guilty, teaching and learning about race and racism, if we commit to doing it well, can really help all children and youth feel empowered to grapple with complicated problems, find solutions that benefit everyone and create a healthier society. And as this quote here reflects uh, in our work, we see many, many parents who believe that this is true. As Christina Andrew. says, the good news is that lots and lots of parents and others uh, are doing this work and we interact with them, obviously not all of them, but with quite a few every day, every week, every month. And we wanted to know more, right? We wanted to be a bit more systematic in understanding you know, who is doing what and in which sectors in the space of what we call children's racial learning. Right? And again, by children's racial learning, we mean how kids are learning about race, what they're learning about race, and how we can support them to learn uh, to have healthy identities and have healthy perspectives on those in communities who are not their own. So late last year, we decided to ask the people who would know, right? We ended up reaching out to 20 people representing five sectors that we thought or knew uh, was doing were in which a lot of work was being done in the space of children's racial learning. So those five sectors were parenting practice, pre-K through 12 education, children's media, the health professions, and social science research. And we called, we collected their contributions, uh, added some other pieces, and called it Reflections on Children's Racial Learning 2023. And you can go to, uh, thank you, Melissa, for putting in the chat the link to that document, which is free to download. 
and we learned a number of things, right? We, they, this group collectively offered a number of insights. And I'm going to draw here both on the reflections and some of the pieces, Christine and I will, to share just a few of those key insights, especially as they pertain to education. So number one, not surprisingly, um, perhaps to those of you listening, is that a great many educators want to do this work. There's no question about that. And we'll, we'll spend some more time on this. There's our own Debbie Lee Keenan, who wrote the lead essay for the section on pre-K through 12 education. Insight number two, I'm sorry, uh, not only do a lot of educators want to do that work, but a lot of parents want you to do that work. This is really important, right? Especially in light of this, uh, again, backlash against teaching and learning about race, which is being framed by those who are leading it as a parent's movement. In fact, if you listen to what the vast majority of parents want, it's that we learn and that their children learn about race and racism. So here, you know, the 84% of parents are extremely open or very open to helping their children learn about race and racism. That comes from a national and nationally representative survey that Embrace Race commissioned at the end of last year. It came out in December. So this is very recent. 61% of the parents who responded, and these were parents of birth through 13-year-old children, right? So 61% of them believe that it was extremely urgent or very urgent, this issue of engaging kids on race. Moreover, huge majorities of Americans believe that the lessons, that lessons about the history of racism, of racism prepare children to build a better future rather than being harmful to, to children, right? So please know that the vast majority of parents are behind you uh, should you be in a position to engage kids on race, racism, and other issues now considered delicate. The second insight uh, that we want to share with you is that this mobilization on behalf of honest teaching of history, honest engagement with the race with children is happening institutionally as well as individually. Meaning of course, there are a lot of people, again, parents, educators, and others who are doing their own work or coming to group, groups like Embrace Race uh, to be supported in this work but it's also happening institutionally, right? Organizations, you know, like the um, American Education Association or the um, American Federation of Teachers, right? Uh, NACI, that some of you may be familiar with, or any number of organizations in education and outside education doing this work. The slide you're looking at shows um, that you know, the other, the flip side of the story we told earlier, whereby, right, in 19 states, legislation had been passed to tamp down on teaching of race and racism. It turns out that as of February of 2022, and I haven't been able to get updated numbers here, in more than 17 states, there have been efforts to expand education on racism and bias, right? That's a good sign. So one side uh, which, again, is doing really important and unfortunately damaging work is capturing all the headlines and most of the attention. But it turns out there is another side where people, institutions, and states are trying to expand attention to these issues that we care about. And then another insight that arose from the reflections is that young people are a huge part of this mobilization as well. So students out there are rallying against book bans, they're hosting protests and walkouts, they're even filing lawsuits to challenge state and district policies. So our students are not passive recipients when it comes to their education. And the agency that they're now exercising is really part of what we're actually cultivating when we teach them about race, racism, and racial justice. So it's important that we don't just talk about kids, but actually talk to them when it comes to their educational rights. And then finally, the reflections highlighted that uh, what we think of as a field of children's racial learning is both needed and wanted. There are so many people doing really great work out there to promote healthy learning about race, um, whether that's educators, parents, researchers, et cetera. 
And by bringing those folks together across these different sectors, we can learn from each other's work and leverage each other's experiences and knowledge in new ways. We can also establish a shared vocabulary and understanding of early racial learning and speak with a more unified voice about the importance of this work. Uh, we can more readily share new ideas and high quality resources to guide our teaching and learning about race um, in developmentally appropriate ways with kids. And we can create the communities that we need to support each other and sustain our practice and move the field forward. And so we believe that educators have an incredibly important role to play in this emerging field of children's racial learning. Um, so we encourage you, first of all, to stay the course. Um, we firmly believe that the heightened political tension of this current moment will be outlasted by steadfast educators. There are many educators who have been doing anti-bias, anti-racist work for a long time and will continue to do so for years to come um, and plenty more that are uh, jumping on board every day. Um, so the current, we believe, really is moving in that direction as long as we stay strong in what we believe is good for children and for the world. And next, we encourage you to stand in solidarity. So form multiracial coalitions and stand with others across race and across other marginalized identities. The fight for an African-American AP course is the fight for learning about Japanese internment in World War II, which is also the fight to read books about LGBTQ characters and so on. Um, and we are more powerful when we stand together on these issues. And school leaders, please, please support your teachers. Uh, we know that one of the most important factors for teachers to engage in this work with students is knowing that their school leaders will stand behind them. Um, that's always been true, but especially now in this climate, that's more true than ever. Also know that the research supports you if you um, embark on this work. Remember that the science of early racial learning tells us very definitively that kids are not colorblind. Uh, remember that there have been decades of practice and research on the benefits of culturally responsive and sustaining pedagogy and multicultural education. Um, and know that there are so many fabulous resources out there already to support you in developmentally appropriate practice to support kids' racial learning. That's at all ages and all grade levels. Um, so seek that out and we will be following up with a resource sheet to help you out there um, if you need it. We also encourage you to invite families in. Um, so in one sense, this is literal. Um, some families are unsure if they support racial learning and anti-bias education in schools because they just don't know what it looks like. Um, and they don't know necessarily that it can be totally developmentally appropriate and very enriching for kids. So if you are doing this work, invite families in um, to see for themselves what you're doing in your classroom. And then another way um, to interpret this is also to engage families as partners when it comes to what and how students are learning in your classroom. And this is related to the idea of funds of knowledge, recognizing that all families are bringing knowledge and experiences and strengths to the table, and we can learn from them and learn with them. So treat the families of your students as partners and assets to your classroom. And then finally, help change the narrative around racial learning. So there's a reason why the terms critical race theory and divisive concepts have been chosen to try to silence talking about race in schools. Uh, those terms have helped create a narrative that what teachers are doing in schools is inappropriate and scary. So we can combat that by changing the narrative around racial learning. We can focus more on positive values like the freedom to learn, having access to honest education and full history, learning from the mistakes of our past so we can do better in the future, choosing courage over fear, and building a better society for everyone. Um, and of course, we can focus on what developmentally appropriate teaching and learning actually looks like and not focusing on these exaggerated claims about what's going on in our schools, which are often made by people who aren't actually working in our schools. So um, we hope that no matter where you are in your own journey and practice when it comes to teaching and learning about race, that you can find 
um, an entry point for yourself among all of these suggestions. This is one of our favorite quotes at Embrace Race. I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. I'm a possibilist. Right? None of us knows, none of us can say for sure where we'll be in a year, much less five years or 15. What we do know, though, is the future is yet to be determined. Right? There are some possibilities that we probably can't get to right now, given where we are. Um, but there's a range of possible futures. Right, even a year out, certainly five years out and beyond that. And where we land, which future, right, in terms of public education, for example, we actually realize will make a big difference. And all of us listening here and participating in this, and the many millions of people obviously not participating in this, collectively will shape which future we come to. So the kinds of uh, recommendations that Christina offers you know, and, and that we will offer in the rest of this conversation and that you all will generate in your own conversations and communities and schools and so on will absolutely shape, you know, the, the, the future and the well-being of the kids in your care and your communities. So please don't be dismayed. Um, there's lots of reason to get out of bed and do this work and just the possibility of realizing a better future than we'd otherwise re otherwise realize. Uh, hopefully, will will keep you will keep you going on. It certainly will keep us moving forward. Thank you. Thank you both. That was great, um, and thank you to Andrew and Christina for really being um, the main folks at Embrace Race putting. Um, this reflections together and for working with, and thanks to all the contributors like Debbie, um, who's often contributed with us, we really appreciate it. And I think you'll really enjoy uh, reading through the reflections and seeing that there is a lot of work bubbling up in different sectors. We looked at children's media, um, at sort of the parenting practice sector, at um, the medical professions and social science research. So there's a lot that's bubbling up. Although I would say that there's a real lot bubbling up in education. Like you educators are sort of ahead of a lot of fields in really considering uh, children's racial learning um, because you know kids pretty well and talk to kids every day and for, probably for many other reasons as well. So we're so glad to be engaged with you, you all in this conversation. Um, I wanna bring Debbie in to this conversation to talk a little bit about, and we're already seeing some of this in the chat, just uh, questions about um, you know, what people can do in their role as educators to, uh, to support children's racial learning and also how they can do it in a way that's safe, you know, that's safe, uh, I suppose, for the kids, um, but which means sort of developmentally appropriate, but also what's safe in these times for the teachers, the educators, because if they lose their jobs, they obviously can't support much of anything. Sure, thank you. Um, a pleasure to be here and join all of you today. Um, this is a question I get all the time, you know, what can I do as a teacher, as an early childhood educator, as an elementary teacher, as a secondary school teacher? How can I do this work? Um, I always say the first thing is that it's a lens. It's a part of everything that you do. Anti-bias education, anti-racist education. It's not check one and I'm done. It's, it's how you see everything. And one, um, uh, some guideposts that we've found very useful that many educators use are the, what we call the four anti-bias education goals. I'm sure some of you on this call are familiar with that. You know, the first goal is it about identity helping making sure that each child and family are visible in your program, helping promote their positive social identities and sense of belonging. The second goal is about diversity, fostering children's empathy, their comfort and joy in human differences and having language to describe these differences. The third goal is about justice. And what does that look like with um, young children or students? Uh, it's really about unfairness, understanding what unfairness looks like, how it feels, that it hurts. 
um, and also to, to develop critical problem solving, critical race thinking about things that are unfair. And then that fourth goal is about justice. I'm sorry, the fourth goal is about action. So once you know something is unfair, you want to help our students feel empowered to stand up for themselves and for others when they see things that are unfair, bias, prejudice, um, discrimination. So if you use those goals as kind of your markers and your lens, so then you're going to look at first in your classrooms, what, what's your, in your environment? What materials are you using? What books, what texts do you provide? What videos? Are they reflecting who you're serving? What we call those mirrors. Are they reflecting the children and families in your program? Are they also providing those windows, right? Mirrors and windows so they can see and experience people who are different than them. This is also, this approach is integrated into everything that you do. It's not just social studies or not just, uh, it's part of math, it's part of science, it's part of outdoor time, um, it's part of lunchtime. Um, it's also how you engage the pedagogy, how you interact with your students. It's how you assess your students. What are they learning? It's the content that you're presenting, how they're thinking about what they're learning. Um, as uh, we've already mentioned, brought up families. I feel that's a key part of doing this work. It's how you engage with families. Uh, we can't do this alone. It takes a village and the families are an important part. Every, every student comes with their families to school. So how do we engage with that? How do we have them think about this kind of work? And then of course, we can't forget our own self work, right? That um, anti-bias, anti-racist work. Um, we have to examine our own biases and our own social identities and how do those impact our work as educators? So I, I also like to say we carry those ghosts on our uh, shoulders. Um, so those are the first things that come to mind when I think about what does this look like? What can I do as an educator? Um, our film, um, Reflecting on Anti-Bias Education in Action, is also available for free uh, from our website. Uh, we'll make sure you get that. Um, it's also in English, uh, Spanish, and, um, and Chinese. Um, and then that question that Melissa asked, I think that's very important about um, given the times, how we started this session about thinking about pushback, you know, how can you do this in a safe way? So I always say, and it's a very common question we get, it depends on your context. You need to start what works for you and to keep on walking, keep on marching, find your lane, for me, I think about those concentric circles. I'm sure many of you are familiar with, familiar with this. Circles of control, circles of influence, and circles of concern. And I think about focus on what I can control and have influence over and not waste my time on things that I'm concerned about, but maybe I can't do anything about it. So we know for some people, you'll be able to go, this way, other people, I'm just taking a baby step. It's all important. It all counts. It all matters. It's to find your entry point and then to keep on walking. So I think that's a key part. Um, and the other big piece, of course, is, which I think we've already referenced also uh, earlier, is about finding your allies, right? Um, you can feel isolated in your own classroom doing this work. Who are your allies? Does your principal have your back? Is it your colleague down the hall? Is it a, one of your family members? Or are your allies outside your organization, outside your program? All that's important. We need to find and build those bridges um, and work together as we do that. Those are great tips, Debbie. Uh, so the curtain has been pulled. Uh, you know that uh, <laughs> Andrew and I are in the same house and um, his internet wasn't working. So Andrew, did you have something to add to that? Only this, two points. Debbie, you spoke so well to this. Uh, just on the safety issue, I want to add a couple of things. On this last point that you made, Debbie, about finding allies, hopefully they're, they are local to you. Some of them are local. Again, as Debbie said, you know, the family members uh, who, again, I'm, I'm going to underline the point that 
the vast majority of parents want this work to happen, right? They would support your working with their kids around honest teaching of race and history and all the other work that Debbie just alluded to. Uh, so yes, try to find them. Try to find your colleagues. Uh, if they're not local, uh, then you know there's so many groups online, you know, on Facebook and elsewhere, where you can find teachers, other educators who absolutely support and are going through some have some of the same uncertainties and questions that you might have, but also have the same ends in mind. And then finally, I mentioned, I think I misspoke and said American Education Association. Of course, I meant the National Education Association, but go to your unions, right? The NEA um, and the American Federation of Teachers have a tremendous number of resources for educators who may be feeling unsafe and are wondering how to navigate uh, the uncertainty that many of you find yourselves in, um, including, you know, I know your rights um, piece at the NEA. So, and then the last thing, and this doesn't speak necessarily to the issue of safety, but I want to underline the thing that Christina said, which is that lots and lots of groups are doing this work, right? Please know that the fight, this fight, and it is a fight, is being engaged in, you know, at many levels, including by legally and in terms of advocacy by groups like the ACLU, you know, the Legal Defense Fund, um, you know, our, our friends at Race Forward, uh, who are working with prospective and actual school board members who want to bring this perspective to those struggles. So the struggle is ongoing and you are far from alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love both those answers and the uh, the reminder, especially to that a baby step matters and to get find your people. And it seems there are those national organizations, but also we, we have on uh, someone said they're a museum educator who's on um, in the chat and they're certainly locally, you know, are uh, there are people that teachers can can work with who are doing this this work, whether they're in museums or libraries or. Uh, you know, food justice organizations, they're really, locally, you'll find those people and that will be very um, emboldening. So thank you for those responses. I'm going to move on to another question because we're we're uh, running out of time here. Um, there's, uh, I'd love to talk about conflict because um, even though, you know, we talked about being safe and finding your allies, as a classroom teacher, you know, you really do, even if you have the support of your administration, uh, you really are on the front lines. You are the one that has to deal with the parent um, who comes in and pushes back um, or the people in your grade cohort who are pushing back and, you know, going to talk to the higher ups or whatever it is. So how do you think about dealing with conflict in those ways in the classroom when it's actually uh, when you're on the front line as a classroom teacher? Um, Debbie, can I start with you? Yeah. Sure. Um... I always say you can't do anti-bias, anti-racist work without embracing conflict, leaning into discomfort, knowing that this is part of the work we do. If you don't get conflict, I'd be more concerned. Um, and we need to think, of, because it, why? Because we're talking about different values, different perspectives, different viewpoints. So it's inherent in the work. Um, but if we see discomfort, conflict, uh, this disequilibrium, this tension as opportunities for growth and learning, we can kind of have a different way of approaching it. We still need to deal with it. But I, I, I ask all of us to see this as part of the work. We have to learn how to manage disequilibrium and, and tension and conflict, to expect it, um, and to take it again one step at a time. Something that helps me when I'm thinking about if I'm going to say, okay, this is, I know this is part of the work. <laughs> I have to be okay with it. And sometimes, I mean, I would say for me, uh, culturally, that was a big step because as a uh, growing up, I was told to be the peacemaker and be the, don't, don't rock the boat. That was the message I got. And I had to, I knew though, from my professional work, that tension is where it's at. That's how we grow and learn. That's only going to happen. So you have to overcome over, I had to overcome those um, goats. Um, but I think about there are different types of conflict. You have what you call internal conflict or disequilibrium, where that's either in yourself and that's going to, you know, you're wondering, is this right or why is, you know, so you need to do your own work about that, right? Your own self work. The second type of conflict is what we call disagreements with stakeholders. 
Um, uh, Melissa just mentioned that it could be often that's between home and school, right? You have one way you're thinking about a home, the child, the student is caught in the middle and another, the family's looking at it a different way. Or it could be between administrators and teachers. It could be among different teachers, among different families. The goal in that kind of conflict, it, which is like disagreement, and this is based on experience or observation, right? You're seeing this kind of conflict is to find a way forward. Even though you have disagreement, you're going to look for the third space and look for common ground. Um, we use a strategy called the three A's. The first one is about acknowledging there's a conflict. The second A is about asking, meaning finding out more with the person you disagree with. And the third A is adapt. So you're finding that common ground. And the fourth type of conflict is what we've talked a little bit more politically today is about opposition. OK, and this is when collaboration in the third space or finding that common ground is not really possible because the intent is really to undermine the anti-bias mission of your program. So what do you do here? I agree to disagree. Um, I'm going to stand strong, keep on walking and doing the work, and I'm going to know who and to pick my battles with. Um, um, what do I have? I go back to that. What do I have influence over? Sometimes the answer is I'm not going to engage because I'm not going to be able to make a difference. I'm not going to waste my time with this. We have to just agree to disagree. And again, looking for my allies there. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Um, I'm going to go to audience questions that I can hear there to, to audience questions, even though I have more for you because we, you know, it's just been so rich that we, Got to keep going, um, but that was very, that was very helpful. And I think it's true that the, uh, as a teacher, you can think, should I tell the parents that we're going to be doing this curriculum, or should I wait till they come in and ask me about it? And the truth is, if you wait or if you tell them before, which I would recommend, they're still going to come in. You know, no matter, there's still there's going to be someone who comes in. It's sort of inevitable, and so just expect it, and then you won't feel like it's a failure when they do, right? Yeah, um, it's part of the work. Thank you for that. I think there's some bumper stickers I could make out of some yeah. of the things you yeah. said there. Debbie. Appreciate it. So um, I wanted to, there was someone who asked um, in the Q&A about this controlling the narrative key. And I wondered, um, Christina, if you could sort of repeat some of those key phrases or sort of elaborate on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I appreciate that question uh, because I, I agree. I think that narrative piece is so important. Um, there's a really great piece that came out maybe a year ago now um, from Matt Kendall Taylor, um, where he talked about how a lot of folks reacted to the anti-CRT push in the initial days by um, trying to get into the weeds about what CRT, what critical race theory is and what it isn't, and um, that that was not actually a, a particularly effective strategy. Um, so. Uh, I really appreciate the the chance to lift up some of the um, narrative moves that might be more effective. Um, so I can I'll go through the list um, again that I mentioned before, um, and then I'll also direct you to a resource. So um, really uh, focusing on shared positive values has been shown to be really effective. Um, so those are things like um, the freedom to learn, giving our kids the freedom to learn. Um, about true history, um, having honest education, full education, um, uh, learning from the mistakes of our past and building a better future for everyone, um, choosing courage over fear. Um, a lot of these conversations can be difficult as we're talking about, they can be difficult for educators, they could be difficult for students. Um, so choosing to embrace that, um, choosing to make mistakes, sometimes because a lot of folks starting out in this space will make mistakes. I will make mistakes when I um, engage in this kind of work. Um, so embracing that and choosing courage. Um, so those are just a few of the ones I mentioned. Um, there is a great resource from uh, our partners at Race Forward. Um, so that's the overall organization. And then they have an initiative called the Heal Together Initiative. So H-E-A-L. Um, we can share this resource with you after too. Um, and maybe someone can throw it in the chat as well. So they have um, a toolkit for organizing around um, 
racial learning in education. And they also outline um, some of these narratives and um, some of the narratives that are coming from more conservative folks, how to sort of counter um, those more negative narratives around racial learning with um, some of these more uh, value focused approaches. Thank you, Christina. And we are going to, there are lots of questions about uh, whether p folks can see the slides again and all of the, these resources, we'll get them all to you as well as resources from Debbie. I've put some of those in the chat. You should all watch her movie if you haven't. And these <clears throat> other resources that Christina mentioned, we can also get to you. So worry not. Um, there, here's a question about what you all are seeing. I mean, after this, we've come out with this reflections, right? And uh, on children's racial learning across sectors. Um, and Debbie, you have been speaking and working uh, with educators across the country and hearing a lot uh, where you are as well in Seattle. Um, and I'm wondering what makes you all hopeful uh, when you think about children's racial learning um, in the country today and how it's being supported. You've, you've named some of that, like that 84% of parents think it's important is pretty key. Uh, but what, what else are you seeing that's making you hopeful? Andrew, do you want to start? Yeah, so certainly part of it is to really underline uh, what we've already said and for us all to think about what it means, right? A lot of people are already doing this work. Right? So we named five sectors, but there are more sectors where this is happening. You think about philanthropy, you think even about government in some cases, you think about journalists, right? 10 years ago, certainly 15 years ago, but I think it's fair to say 10 years ago, when some horrible and obviously racialized thing happened like Charlottesville, right? Or the you know so-called Muslim ban or you know the spate of um, uh, you know, educational gag orders, it wasn't the case 10 years ago that we would see right, this, this outpouring of articles speaking to parents about how to talk to kids. Now we see it after everyone, right? Tyree Nichols, right? George Floyd, you know, all the many things that have happened, we see it every time. That's a sea change. And that's really important, right? So it's not only, though, that there's all of this work already happening and more and more efforts being started every day. You know, when we started Embrace Race in 2016, uh, the field of organizations paying attention to this issue and especially to how parents engage or don't engage with this issue was much smaller than it is now, mm -hmm. right? To be sure, much, much more work is needed. But that's the second piece of good news I want to offer that uh, it is very clear to us from these reflections and from all of our engagement. And Debbie, I know you would say the same that so many of these people, all of these people who are already doing the work and some who aren't, want to see much more mm -hmm. and have ideas about what that much more, what forms of the much more that we could do would take. So we're in conversations with partners around, you know, a um, national conference that could become a regular thing every year, every other year on children's racial learning that would pull all these folks together. We're in conversations about you know, building infrastructure to, to connect people, to allow us, all of us who are engaged in this work or want to be, to identify ourselves to each other, right, as people interested in this work, um, so that we can learn from each other and perhaps partner with each other. You know, and I really could go on uh, in, in terms of the number of ideas, some of them really big ideas that there's tremendous enthusiasm for. So there is a lot, I think, to be mm -hmm. encouraged about. And, you know, as they say, the uh, the bread doesn't bake itself. We need to do it, right? We need to get together, set the agenda, and start doing more and more things. But I guarantee you that the will to do that, um, and I think the resources we need, are available to us. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, Debbie, did you want to add about what you're yeah, seeing? Yeah, a couple of things. I, uh, yeah, first of all, um, I am optimistic, I think. Yes, th that the murder of George Floyd, because it was so visible, and the, then the Black Lives Matter movement re resurgence. At, so you saw both. You, people are seeing this, but there's so much more energy. I see a lot more resources um, in the last couple of years, particularly created by BIPOC people. 
Um, so there's a lot more out there. I'm also seeing when I go to different places, when I'm shit, when I, with this recent uh, video, our, our movie that came out in 2021, I've had the opportunity to share it, you know, around the world many, many times and in places that I wouldn't expect it. You know, where the places where, yes, of course they want that, the quote blue states, but so many red states, so many places where there are those gag orders, people have hungry for this information because there are people marching. There are people doing this in every little spot. Um, I kind of had shared in my essay um, the, the idea, you know, my pipe dream is that, you know, what if, you know, when we talk, I talked about disagreement and tension and how that's part of this work. Well, what if every, you know, school, every church, every temple, every mosque, every youth and senior center were able to have community suppers, you know, once a week, once a month, um, and bring people from different perspectives together to talk about, you know, how are we the same and how we're different, you know, to uh, break that bread together, but not just with those of us who we agree with, but those of us who are different, because I believe that is the way change will happen. It has to come this one-on-one -on -one, um, and getting to know each other and listening. I love that. So to sum up, we need to make the bread. It doesn't make itself and we need to, need to break the bread together. Yeah. <laughs> make and break those are <laughs> two two part two part plan um so we don't have we don't have any more time left but uh please know that this has been great uh you can download the reflections and let us know um what you think and how your institutions might want to partner or think about it we're definitely in the ideation stage in terms of thinking how to build this field between um, educators and many others doing this work so we can help together, educators, parents. Um, and yeah, many resources to get you from uh, Christina, uh, from Debbie and Debbie's shop. And um, please sign up for the Embrace Race newsletter. We have uh, regular events and lots of resources, so you all should check it out and write us if there's something that you can't find. Um, Debbie Lee Keenan, thank you so much as My always pleasure. for joining us. Um, Christina, Andrew, awesome reflections. <laughs> Debbie too. Thank yeah. You. So thank you. Yeah. And to all of you, we really appreciate your, yes. your interest says a lot. So thank yes. you. Thanks, Keep everyone. on going. Keep on marching. Yeah. Do it. Bye-bye everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.